This week's episode was brought to you by Jack Sanders and Laura Mullen. Thank you, Laura and Jack. It's with the generous support of listeners like you that we get to keep digging down new esoteric rabbit holes every week. If you'd like to help support the show, please visit www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit, where your monthly donation of just five dollars gets you access to all our extended shows, a five by five vinyl sticker of our big boovied cover art and access to our discord server where fans and creators of the show hang out to discuss interesting stuff you're not allowed to talk about. On this week's episode, we tell the story of the Buddha pausing to explore some of the most interesting and less well-known parts of his story. We talk about the Buddha's upbringing, the simulated reality he broke out of, his flirting with extremism, conversations with the devil, and the little-known tale of his death. In the extended show, we discuss the sorceress and shamanic aspects of Buddhism and how a state-employed demon saved the Dalai Lama. Thank you, and enjoy the show. apocalypse fighting over the last crazy bread crazy bread i don't know I if hate... they'll survive the apocalypse waffle house maybe oh god we deserve something better than waffle house in the end a waffle house was built as like an emergency system isn't it like to feed people in crises they have all sorts of protocols it's kind of interesting though in the gulf of mexico uh their waffle house stays open while hurricanes roll ashore that's why They've they're got prepared. Like a backup auxiliary power in the Waffle House to work in a place where even a disaster would give me a day off. That'd be bullshit. <laughs> I've worked at a Waffle House, man. That shit sucks. You worked at a Waffle House? Yeah, for like five seconds. What if that's yeah. what Buddha found deep down in the side of his soul? That Atman is really a Waffle House. Uh, uh, I have to say that I would no longer be enthusiastic about using or abusing any of their ideas. I don't want to go to Waffle House. If, if that's the case, then there is no... Uh, there is no God. In Canada. There's no God in Canada. That sounds about right. There is now, toot toot! <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to The Whole Rabbit, where we don't just bend a knee to the bloodthirsty native elemental spirits that demand sacrifice, fancy rituals, and confusing incantations. Nay, we spiritually dominate the wrathful deities using our invincible bodhicitta until they are loyal protectors of our new state religion, because this week we're discussing Buddhism, and why if you see the Buddha on the path, you should bonk him. I'm your host, Luke Madrid, the Hack Rabbit. I'm joined this week by co-host, Her Holiness Queen Mari Maya Sama Sambava Rinpoche. Wow, what an introduction. The Wrathful Dorje Dingus. Kill, kill, kill. The Dark One, Mara Core 5. Hello, what's up? And the adorably calamitous Quan Yin, Heka Astra. Hello. <laughs> oh, she's an arsonist. She's calamitous. I learned that Quan Yin is associated with sound, actually. And Quan Yin oh. is gender fluid. I didn't know that. So as a kid, my mother told me, Son, if you see the Buddha on the path, you must kill him. <laughs> Even as a kid, I understood that Buddhism is stereotypically known for its adherence to ahimsa. It's a Sanskrit word that means nonviolence. More specifically, non-slapping. <laughs> so when I heard the phrase uttered the first time, I was a little shook. I asked my mom. Why? What does that mean? And she explained that if you observe Buddha to be outside of you, that is not the Buddha. But an illusion like an oasis in the desert, if you chase it, you'll never find the satisfaction you seek. Consequently, it's prudent to entirely dispose of worshipping or seeking a Buddha externally. Well, that's like one of the interesting features of Buddhism right out the gate is that as Westerners or pagans or what have you, when, when we look at Buddhism and we look at the Buddhas, we think of them as deities, but they're not. In Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha, which we may mention throughout the episode, it's technically fiction, and they separate the character Gautama 
from Siddhartha, and they change a few things around, but it's, it's more or less the same ideas. After the Buddha attains some level of enlightenment, not yet his supreme enlightenment, he goes out walking the countryside, and he explains that he's enlightened to somebody, and the person responds, you might be, and just walks away. And immediately the Buddha's frustrated because he doesn't look special, he doesn't have like a magical glow. He has to like win people over by, well, firstly, his good looks, and second of all, his teachings. Because no head of any religious organization can be ugly. He was, he was a hot man. He was real good looking. Oh, so the idea was supposed to be that like he could fuck, but chose not to fuck. Because that would perpetuate suffering. He had he fucked and was good at it. Oh yeah, he had a kid. I did have sex. I did. 20 years ago. We've come across this motif while studying Eastern religion, and it's that Buddhism is amazing at propagating itself and making propaganda in general. I think it's been underestimated. We discovered that Tsukumogami yokai were created as propaganda to recruit people into esoteric Buddhism. No Buddhism propaganda, no Pokemon. The Dalai Lama is basically a rock star in the West. We watched one documentary where he's musing on what he knows about spirits, and he mentions that spirits are usually believers or non-believers, and that's the case in almost every culture. But ghosts can be a little bit different in every culture. And then he sort of wondered if there were communist ghosts. And then he laughs uproariously to himself. He's kind of a fun guy. <laughs> it does sound fun. Yeah, I mean, if you're still walking around here, you probably believe something. And it's probably completely useless to you because you're dead. And it's kind of funny because, you know, the original Pokemon, right? Pokemon, when we were growing up, at least I was, was big, big time propaganda, man. It was everywhere. And oh, like, yeah. Every single one of my friend, my peers had pokemon or was into pokemon so yeah definitely carries that essence of propagating well it's like it's like christianity in which it's like this kind of palatable religion that's uh, supposedly centered around peace your ultimate escape of suffering that they can like easily atomize the symbols and infuse them into art or just like wire them into other cultures or a game the or mechanics about... of it and then the balance of the elements also is like an aspect that links to it there's not a lot about buddhism that makes it particularly offensive to other religions in the areas surrounding it at first except for hinduism and like the concepts <laughs> of buddhism can be easily integrated into say shintoism or uh when combined with taoism you get shaolin there's a lot of different ways it has cross-pollinated with other cultures in the area. There's a reason why we're attracted to the story of the Buddha, and I think we have underestimated Buddhist propaganda. I don't want to say who. I'll talk about it more in depth in the Discord if somebody wants to ask me, but I was studying under a well-known teacher, an excellent teacher and author in the field of magic, and in his private courses, he told us kind of on the down low that prior to 9-11, there was this understanding amongst the spiritual, intellectual, and political elite within America that they would endeavor to slide America from being a Christian nation over to being a Buddhist one. Now, this sounded profound like what when I heard that but then I thought about it a little bit more and if you go back to pre 9-11 media the movies that my generation grew up on dingus you're a little young perhaps there's this definite theme of the Buddha maybe even the story of the Buddha and this idea of non-being there's this idea of a spiritual reality that you can attain to by breaking out of the social norms that have encased our culture and have led us to frustration and have essentially left us thirsty for something more because that was the world that the Buddha grew up in. He grew up in a world where the Vedic religions weren't really serving the people anymore and people were burnt out. There was social class discord and disharmony and the old religious motifs just weren't doing it. So we see the same motif in a lot of movies growing up like oh, just look at 1999 American Beauty, Fight Club, the Matrix, Man on the Moon, even you have the Phantom Menace, tell me that's not Hinduism in space, ideas about what it means to be a person, Bicentennial Man, and Magnolia, the idea that everything is connected. So I think there is some truth to the idea that like, have you seen Kundun? Okay, like the Dalai Lama and, and the Buddhists have some, I think that they on the low always got some top tier propaganda brewing. That's just what I think. Well, now. it is interesting to think about, too, because it seems like essentially before 2016, I saw more of this on the Internet. It was more culturally relevant or political tensions got more extreme. But it did seem to me like liberals just ate up Buddhist concepts, like even if they weren't 
necessarily spiritual liar. Like you'd hear all these rich liberal CEOs talking about yeah. how I increase my productivity through through mindfulness meditation. You jack off. My dad had a friend and it was this just this white guy he was friends with just all of a sudden this priest out of nowhere. And upper class, probably liberal Democrat, probably an engineer of some kind, really intelligent. So that was extremely popular then, not even in movies, but like people were converting actively and teaching it. Just for instance, we could do a whole episode on it. I believe Fight Club is almost a, a retelling of the story of the Buddha, but in a Western fantasy gothic kind of world. I can see that. That's weird. The thing is, there are like lots of Jesuses and lots of Buddha figures throughout history. In a way, I feel like Buddha does serve the same purpose as Jesus did with the Western religions. They're very similar. Siddhartha and Yeshua both came about in a time when the established religions just weren't working. People had a lot of ideas about how to reach God. And here comes this handsome upstart overachiever who's born within this place. And he just breaks out of all the molds and he just beats everyone. And he comes out with this rock star message that's so revolutionary. And everyone who comes to him is changed and awakened. It's this archetypal story that we've come to fall in love with. And I believe... A lot of these movies pre 9-11, they had a spiritual element to them, but they also had a like, you have to break out of materialism. You have to break out of ego. There is something out there, but you first have to free yourself, which is a very Eastern take on spirituality. And, you know, freeing yourself might sound easier. Uh, than what it sounds like. But if you free yourself and your mind isn't developed, then you're just going to come right back in. Oh, yeah. The teachings of Buddha, there's a pass to go on, is because the ultimate goal is to get out of this, out of this wheel. In the extended part, I will talk about the wheel a little bit in detail. And if you've watched past episodes, it all correlates with demons and zodiacs and stuff like that. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there dwelled within the heaven of the contented a bodhisattva who having been fully conscious for many lifetimes, decided to enter the womb of his mortal mother in a small village of Lombini, a small town on the Indian border a bit north of the holy city of Benares. When the Bodhisattva descended, as it is told, the entire universe, including the realm of the devas, suras and asuras, were illuminated with a flash of limitless light, more brilliant than any before it. Even in the realms of darkness, where neither sun, nor the moon's glow could penetrate. The flash of light of the holy presence was felt. There was no part of the universe, seen or unseen, which did not feel the subtle blessing of the Buddha's incarnation. This was especially true of his mother, Queen Maya Sakya, who, once upon a dream, was whisked away by four devas to Lake Anatara in the Himalayas. After bathing in the lake, the devas clothed her in heavenly clothes, anointed her with perfumes, and bedecked her in divine flowers. Soon after, a white elephant holding a white lotus flower in his trunk appeared and circled her three times, entering her womb through her right side. When she awoke, she knew something special had happened. The four devas stayed to protect the pregnant Queen Maya from all danger, mortal and spiritual, that might attack from each of the four cardinal directions. As clearly as one beholds a piece of pure barrel, Queen Maya could behold the child in her womb, which never caused her the slightest discomfort. One day, while walking in the park under the salt tree, she blissfully gave birth while standing up, holding on to one of the branches. The devas made it rain to clean the baby, who had fortuitously exited through his mother's, quote, right side. As is tradition when giving birth to a Buddha, she died a week later and was reborn in the heaven of the contented. That's what a shit deal. You give birth to the Buddha and you stay in samsara? Bullshit. Buddha is a selfish lover. Yeah, Jesus dies. His mom outlives him. She becomes his first disciple. Like, the Buddhists have the same thing because after the Buddha attains enlightenment, he goes up to heaven for a little while and then teaches his mom the Bodhidharma for for a minute. Oh, okay. So that, that's how they uh, that's how they retcon that. Because I remember in the Bardos, it was stated explicitly that, uh, that being a god was pretty great as far as lifestyle was concerned, but you wouldn't be, like, very interested in your spiritual expansion. Isn't it nice how the, the devas made it rain to clean the baby of the f disgusting lady fluids all over it? Yeah, no one could just yeah. touch it and watch it. Wash it, it had to be rain. I yeah. would not want to touch any of her lady juices. In some editions, there are no lady juices on him because he's that amazing. Wow. Unsullied Nothing's by lady more juices. Amazing. Nothing is more amazing than lady juices. Get out of here. But the child Maybe was except for some, some man milk. But the child was unsullied by the lady juices. 
There is no man milk in this process either. So much like Tyler Durden, his legends precede him, whether they're true or not. I'm happy you said the word retconned. Queen Maya was named as such for being the wife of the Sakya clan king, Pseudo Hadana. King Pseudo Hadana, excited to know the fate of his noble son, sought the counsel of his fortune tellers. Of the king's son, the fortune tellers were sure of the following. If his son embraced the world, he would become Chakravartan, the uniter of all India and eventually the world. However, if the child forsook the world, he would become its redeemer. His father named the child Siddhartha, which means he who attained his goal, and immediately began preparing a life of worldly indulgence for his son. Sudhodana was not going to let his future Chakravartin become a penniless yogi. But yogis smoke weed all the time. Why wouldn't you want that? Only if they worship Shiva. Om Shiva. Om. Well. Donna, Which one was Shiva happen. again? The one that kills a lot? Yeah. Yeah, the death god. Uh, that's my that's my favorite one too. Yeah, me too. I prefer. I Kali. like his waifu. Yeah, yeah, Kali. Yeah, I like Kali as well. She's a bitch. She's a cool bitch though. I'd hang out with her. She hit me with the blunt side of her sickle. I've got a dent in my head. This is interesting. So the father wanted to drive um, Siddhartha to to indulge in the material world so that he could conquer the world materially, right? And that he would be famous. Well. The other interesting thing there is that Chakravartin is associated with a different, um, with a different kind of uh, elite Buddhist figure, which is the quote wheel-turning monarch that was referred to in the Bardo. And the idea behind the wheel-turning monarch is that he's like the apex of secular achievement in Buddhism. He is a, a ruler for the good of all mankind, I see. A, as mentioned in the book. He's the, the wheel-turning monarch is defined by their ability to, to unify nations without war, their charisma. I think his father in this story had, like, no concept of what that apex of achievement in either direction would even look like. He was stuck in his worldly ways. Mm, oh, okay. So in Herman Hesse's fictionalized version, he's from the Brahmin class, but truly Siddhartha was born to the Kshatriya class, the warrior class right below it. And the Shakya clan were like warriors. And he was considered a sage of the Shakya clan, which is where he got the name Shakya Muni. And he's often referred to as Shakya Muni in the texts. I was just going to say it's a funny name. To accomplish Siddhartha's attachment to the world, his father spared no expense. He was given three palaces under his control, along with no less than 40,000 attendant dancing women, with orders that no ugliness intrude on the young prince. He was to be shielded from contact with decrepitude, sickness, and especially death. Even when the prince went out riding, attendants would ride ahead and clear away all traces of these things from his path. If you think, if you think your parents were, were like really sheltering, this is way more sheltering. I mean, this is, this is like the life of like a, a fucking uh, a Donald Trump Jr. or something, you know, like. We've all known a shitty rich kid that's a little bit like this. Their parents watch him from, like, the fence at school and shit. This is really, really extreme, though. Like, he doesn't even know what sickness is yeah. for a long time. He and any time one of his whores catch the clap, they cut her head off and give her another one that looks exactly like the first. No death. There is no death in bossing, say. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. So one day, whether he was overlooked or perhaps an incarnation of the gods... Siddhartha came across an old man, hunched over, broken-toothed, decrepit, and covered in gray hair as he was walking along the path. On this day, Siddhartha learned of old age. In response, the king doubled his guard that the young prince would encounter no more worldly ugliness on his daily rides. Yet still, on another day, Siddhartha crossed a man crawling along the road. This man was covered in boils, groaning in agony and racked with illness unspeakable. On this day, Siddhartha learned of sickness. That's brutal. Despite his father's best efforts, it was not long before Siddhartha would happen upon a corpse by the road. On this day, Siddhartha then learned of death. Not picking up the, the old-ass woman by all four of her limbs and tossing her into the river? Understandable. Not touching the leper? Understandable. You can pick up a corpse. Just just rub some uh, rub some tiger balm or some shit. A little, uh, little chompa flower under your nose. Wear some sunglasses. It'll be fine. So on the fourth occasion, Siddhartha came upon a man with a shaved head, a begging bowl, and ochre robes. On this day, he learned that there was such thing as a worldly path of renunciation. 
Once he knew aging, sickness, and death were inevitable, the charms of life suddenly lost their effect on him. Like a wave rolling back, the pleasure and the thrill of life had begun to recede, and there was no going back. The lavish feasts, musical processions, festivals, and promises of worldly power suddenly became dull. There was an unrest stirring within Siddhartha. When his wife, Honorable Princess Yosidara, bore him a son, Siddhartha named him Rahula, meaning fetter on the path to enlightenment. Homeboy literally named his son Ball and Chain. That's pretty brutal. Looking down the long, long barrel of fatherhood, Siddhartha, sometime during his 29th year, bid his wife and newborn child a silent goodbye in the middle of the night. He bid his servant to prepare his majestic white horse and ride with him all night to the edge of the forest where he donned ragged garments and walked alone into the thick wood to work out his own enlightenment. You know, that's funny. I also call my penis the long, long barrel of fatherhood. Small world. The servant came back with the horse, and everybody was sad. Did they eat the horse? I don't think so, unless they needed jello. How hard to live the life of the lonely forest dweller, to rejoice in solitude. Verily, the silent groves bear heavily upon the buck who is not yet one to fixity of the mind. Man, that whole story, like, seriously, I brought up uh, Bossing Say and Avatar again, but the Earth King is literally this exact story. Uh... Yeah, like, because, you know, the Fire Nation takes over, the Nazis take over the world, and the Earth Kingdom has, like, their appointed puppet king, and, and there's, he's like, no crime. And everything. He's everything. Yeah. He doesn't know about any of that stuff. There, there, he doesn't know about the war that's going outside the walls of his city, and, like, everybody in the city that's rich, they're under the, the under spell the of propaganda. Mm-hmm. That but then, everything's beautiful and all that. Yeah. But after they, after they broke, break through and it becomes occupied, he actually, like, sets off as a beggar, a traveling beggar around the world. Yeah, he has a he abdicates his what, throne. What's his animal? It's like a bear it's and a... Blusco. It's a It's a bear. And everyone's weirded out because it's just a bear. Because all of the animals in the show are like are, a mixture of things. Yeah, they're all like two animals in one. Okay. But yeah, it's just a bear. He rides off and becomes, becomes a bigger kind of yeah. guy. Yeah. Well, he learns the world that he had been missing out on. But it's just interesting how you can also be exploited when you're, you know, if you're, if you're sheltered that hard, it can be exploited and taken advantage of by other people who know better than you yeah and so the opposite of that would be to go into the forest right because you're clearly not gonna, you're gonna get stuck in the worldly uh tether as long yeah. as you're like the king and stuff like that you gotta strip all that go into the forest and that's the way you're gonna find the way out of the wheel yeah i, I think that's what he realized before he, even his enlightenment he's like i need to get out of that you know i need to work on my mind because everything in the world i can achieve but the mind is something you have to just mental surgery i guess you know you have to go inside yourself and well you can't force. reach out and grab peace of mind no yeah you have to attain it by through wisdom and experience which is what he was going for he realized he had to do his experience now and as an adult which kind of sucks there in the forests he studied under hinduism's foremost gurus learning much of vedic philosophy ritual and yogic practice his criticisms more so than his agreements made him beloved of vedic religion which he saw rejuvenating reforms in the Buddha's wake. The Hindus uh, often claim him as one of their own. The Hindus have a have a habit of doing that. I think uh, like some sects have also officially added Jehovah, which would which would have been like good to mention yesterday. Quote Jehovah as like a Hindu god. But I saw that on Channel Six Southeast Texas News once, so that probably doesn't mean anything now that I think about it. We love them, and we love them. One of us. One of us. One of us. When it comes from Southeast Texas Channel 6 News, it's really more of like, look, they're accepting Jesus. That's that's what they mean. Oh, God. Yeah. So it's worth mentioning that the Buddha was frustrated intelligent, handsome, and described frequently as having a perfect body. He was not afraid to argue with a guru once he had learned everything they had to teach, not to be one-upped. Siddhartha put his new lack of money where his mouth was and became an ascetic. After all, India was home to the long-established Vedic religions, which preached fasting from the world in order to attain liberation from it. If these were the rules of the game, then Siddhartha would be able to achieve these conditions. After all, Siddhartha accomplished everything Siddhartha set his mind to. If these were the steps a mortal could take to enlightenment, the young Shakyamuni would devote his godlike will to it and surely succeed. As expected, Siddhartha excelled in all of the renunciate's exercises. Siddhartha quotes during the renunciation from the world, when I thought I would touch the skin of my stomach, I actually took hold of my spine. He was skinny. Mm-hmm. He was like skeletal. Yeah. Six grains of Jeez. rice per day on a fast. Oh my God. 40 days in the desert ain't got nothing on this bitch. <laughs> 
He said he'd clench his teeth and press his tongue to his palate until sweat flowed from my armpits. He'd hold his breath until it felt as if a strap were being twisted around my head. Damn. Really, really pushing his body to kind of break out of materiality. He's like, if this is how you do it, I'm going to do it. Really hard. He probably just uh, has a thing for asphyxiation. Who knows? <laughs> I was just going to say, he came so close to death by doing these practices. One day, he collapsed. Fortunately, a girl named Sujata was kind enough to scoop some rice gruel into his mouth so that Siddhartha may live. Legends usually recount it was Siddhartha's favorite rice pudding dish and not just some old rice water. But when you're that hungry, it might be hard to tell the difference. Although it's technically fiction. Herman Hesse's Siddhartha tells us that while Siddhartha was a Samana, he learned to push his consciousness into objects people, or even ideas to temporarily escape the fetters of material incarnation, only to helplessly return when the exercise was over. Although gifting him with a handful of useful cities, we call them force powers, he was no closer to enlightenment, lamenting at one point that drunks in the tavern do equally well to find temporary release. Uh, could he do Kamehameha? Probably. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's where it comes to, from, right? Gotta go to Turtle does... Hermit Island. <laughs> Wow, this is this is the uh, this is the anime Buddha who who could like transfer some kind of magical current with his voice into the very fabric of ideas. Yeah, that's essentially what you know, Hebrew is, and Enochian is trying to mathematically and magically prove to us as we learn. Yeah, but but it's... could you imagine being able to just alter the connotative meaning of a word because you said it, so that somebody would just automatically assume it implies what you mean? That's a Jedi mind trick, man. It's magic. Yeah, it's magic. I think this may have been the tongues of flame that came upon Christ's apostles after he died. That same power. So either way, once Sujata placed the rice in the young Shakyamuni's mouth, his life as an ascetic was over. When he, his fellow monks saw him eating, they were disgusted and they denounced him as a lover of indulgence. Siddhartha's failed experiment with asceticism led him to establish a primary tenet of his path, the taking of the middle way. The Buddha would teach neither extreme asceticism or indulgence, urging his followers to give their bodies what they needed to function optimally, but no more. Because of these experiences in the forest, the Buddha would forever turn his back on the mortification of the flesh as a path to enlightenment. And this is where the balance aspect comes in for me, because I am, I'm a middle path too, and part of it is indulging in one side and then balancing it out by indulging in the other side, and then it's it's really it's really difficult to stay in the middle that's why it's a it's such an effective path it rejects extremes at every turn well you can become lost in extremes i guess it, the, it eliminates the extremes to the left and the right it, it shoots you up like, yeah the usefulness of the middle path is that it's necessarily free from the dogma of, of left or right and so it allows you to take your spiritual teachings and express your genuine self yes I, like uh, as a left-hand path practitioner i always found it obnoxious and, and silly and a little infantile that there's so many people on the left-hand path who will tell you that you must necessarily use offensive or satanic imagery in your practice because because it, it scares other people but it doesn't scare me so why the fuck does it matter? <laughs> you know? Well, you get their fear energy. That's the think, point of that. I think it's tacky. I'll just show them my long barrel of fatherhood. <laughs> I feel like I've read enough Anton LaVey to weigh in on this. If it makes your dick hard or your pussy wet, that's what you should be doing. You want to yeah. like it. You want to be like, oh, that's cool as fuck. That's the one condition, in my opinion. From what I read, you know, and, and this brings us to the point that there is some antinomian satanic elements to Buddhism, and we're going to start to get into that now. So rejecting self-denial earnestly from a place of sincere experience is what propelled Siddhartha forward with enough spiritual momentum to feel that he was approaching a major breakthrough. Honoring this intuitive momentum, Siddhartha determined that he would focus on the final push needed to send him hurtling towards the ultimate revelation on this particular day. Somewhere outside of Gaia, the young Shakyamuni sat down under a peepal tree, retiring into deep, focused repose until the goal was finally accomplished. Heat people. Eat people. Was that what you said? No, I said he heat people. It just, it's a funny word. People. People tree. They eventually called oh. it the Bodhi tree, which means enlightenment tree. He was, he was a hermit. He was, he was peepooling. 
I mean, that is like a just just the motif of him even earlier walking lonely through the woods and like lamenting on how hard it was. Like if you were to compare him to a tarot card, it'd be the hermit. The hermit holds the light in the jar, you know. I just I think I think that's interesting how there's some crossover. When he did this, Mara, the evil one, sensing Siddhartha was nearing the goal, sent his three daughters to assail him with Kama or sensual desire. When the soon-to-be Buddha remained unmoved, Mara took on the form of death and began assaulting the Bodhisattva with hurricanes, arrows, flaming rocks, and floods, but his attack found no target as they fell powerless upon Siddhartha's field of concentration. Overwhelmed with anger and frustration, Mara roared ferociously to know what right a mortal had to even do what he was doing. In response, the awakened Buddha touched the earth, which shook in confirming witness, frightening Mara and his forces away. In response, the gods showered him with garlands and perfume. The tree under which he sat blossomed lotuses in the May moonlight. As the morning star dawned, Siddhartha's consciousness pierced the final bubble of existence, shattering it all into naught, only to find the universe restored to its fullness and effulgence of unfiltered truth. Siddhartha had awakened, and he had finally become the Buddha. And that's where the gong gets hit. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, gotta... It happened when Venus rose on the horizon is when it happened. Ah. Oh, yeah. He saw the morning star. Angels to some, demons to others. Buddha to me. Also, just uh, just just to keep the audience informed, if you, if you uh, to take it back to our Bardo episode for a minute, for context, Mara is the lord of death, as described in the Bardo Thudal. He's the guy who uh, breaks your bones, licks up your brains, and drinks your blood when you die. Yeah. He's also a tempter. Yeah. I don't even, I see Mara as exceedingly wise and almost as Buddha's best teacher and friend. Just for my, I could well, be wrong. Being, he's being a Satan, you know. He is being a Satan, yes. Yeah, the snake on the tree, pretty much. Like, like Jesus wouldn't be half as Jesus if it wasn't for Satan making life difficult for him. In the Hebrew sense of the word, this is absolutely a Satan. Indubitably. So in celebration, the entire universe pretty much threw a, a big blooming flowers party. It filled the whole cosmic vastness with a bouquet of flowers. Sounds lit. It implies that the gods have the ability to do this all the time, but just don't. <laughs> they were yeah. saving up the money shot for this one. Yeah, it's it's kind of like their, their new year or something, maybe. Saving up the money shot under the people tree. <laughs> it was It was depressing until Buddha did this, apparently. The whole universe was depressed. So engulfed oh. with rapture was the Buddha that he sat contented for seven days before even attempting to stand. When he did, he was put straight back on his ass in bliss for another 49 days. In preparation to stand again, the Buddha opened his eyes for the first time, opening his glorious gaze upon the world, and found Mara waiting for him with one last temptation. Why even stand, O Buddha? To go forth in the world and unto what purpose? To teach that which may only be learned? Show what may only be discovered. Preach that which defies imprisonment in the word. Why even stand, O Buddha, to play the fool to an uncomprehending audience? Why even stand, O Buddha, when you could forsake the body and retreat now into nirvana? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about Buddhism. We got to talk about nirvana. And that is like the dopest band in the world. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, it, it's also it's also such like, like it's such a basic fear um, for for anybody that just might have like some kind of wisdom to share with people, or, or not a fear, but like it is this thought that occurs to you when you're about to tell somebody something, and you wonder whether or not they can even understand it, or it's just going to be a waste of your time. Or you might you, you might divert them from the right path as well by explaining it, and they misinterpret it. Making another comparison to Jesus here, Jesus, one of Jesus' most famous phrases was, be sure not to spread your pearls amongst swine, lest they trample them under their feet and then come for you. I, I mean, it, it's a pretty basic concern when you know something, or it's like you have some, you just, you're more well-educated than somebody, and, uh, and you try to give that to them, but they just simply refuse the information. Nirvana is a, is a state of emptiness. It's not filled with desire. It's not filled with craving. It's not filled with attachment to physical objects. It's a state of emptiness that allows flow and understanding. It's the, the state of emptiness that brings you to enlightenment. Isn't it no mind? Like, right. It's not it's, the end. It's, it's emptiness of self, but fullness of spirit. Yeah, it's, it's basically the, the it's very similar to moksha if not the same 
Um, I would maybe say this is probably like Tifereth and like, you know, meeting your holy guardian angel. Like this isn't the end, but like you're getting there. Like you, you got what you need now and like you got to just work on that. And then there's like a dragon maybe fight. <laughs> but uh, I think it might be that state. Like it's, it's what we should be focusing on right now if you haven't done it. You have to do that first. Like it's a very important thing, but it's not the end, I think, in Buddhism. In Indian religions, nirvana is synonymous with moksha and mukti, but it carries with it a different connotation. In Sanskrit, it means blown out, and this refers to the extinction of the three fires that cause rebirth. So you're, you're snuffing it. Something is getting snuffed. It's the thing that keeps you coming back. It's extinct. It's the same as being liberated, but it carries with it this negative quality. It's a good negative, but it is negative, where something is being snuffed out. It's over. The bullshit is finally over. No more monkey business! <laughs> of all the temptations, this one last one from Mara almost found its mark. The Buddha long considered Mara's argument before replying humbly, If even one understands, it will have been worth it. And Mara was forever banished from Buddha's life. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> Basically, Mara was trying to tempt him with fear or self-doubt, where since he had attained enlightenment, which we were just talking about, it really is elevating yourself above your own physical ego. Mara also has a vested interest in, in keeping as many people incarnating as possible, because that's like his whole business model. Keep them confused and still, you know, stuck in the wheel. Exactly. Well, he also tempts him, like, at the very end, his last temptation is, is basically, like, death, like, end to the suffering of the Just of kill the yourself. Why, why do that? You could die right here and reach nirvana. Yeah, trying to get him to give up. It's like when you get to the top of the holy mountain and the devil's like, you could have all this, dude. And you're like, no, I want to go higher. The holy mountain. So for the next 45 years, the Buddha walked the countryside lecturing, taking questions, stoking the faithful and the perplexed alike. He accepted all who came to him with kindness, dignity, and sincerity. Those who knew him and heard the advice he gave noticed a discernible pattern the Buddha seemed to follow. Buddha retired three times a day to turn inward and meditate. Nine months of the year, Buddha taught in the countryside, retreating with his monks during the rainy season. Taking time to focus oneself inwardly preceded all things the Buddha did. Again, like getting to nirvana and no mind and making that a regular practice. He's a master of it, right? He's already pretty much awakened, but he still requires three times a day to turn inward. So what does that tell? Like, if you're not doing that for yourself, then there's a problem. Like, you should probably start. Even the awakened I, one needed to do that. And that, that blows my mind because I think, you know, I need time to decompress. Like I had a really bad week and I had to call off everything yesterday just to rest. But because I don't take, I don't ever <laughs> take time to do that. It's amazing how much better I feel just from like not from just disconnecting myself from any obligations or any like worldly worries. So yeah, I should probably meditate more. Well, it's interesting to me too, because he meditates three times a day. Like he has to eat. Like, because he is alive and incarnated yeah. as a human, he has to sustain this state with meditation. That's it's interesting point. that that he meditates like how we would eat or how, like, yeah, normal people would eat. That's interesting. Yeah, that's a great point. Living off the manna. As much myth surrounds the Buddha's divinity, the man himself never claimed to be anything other than awake, which is where the title comes from. Bud, meaning awake. Buddha, being he who is awakened. During a time of relative peace, he was sometimes sought for advice in war, but was unable to convince his audience of taking a different path, which sometimes turned out tragically. After all, Buddhism was never about miracles or even the divinity of the Buddha, but rested in practical teachings like the Four Noble Truths. So the Four Noble Truths outlines a basic framework summary of Buddhist perspective and path work based on acknowledging that suffering is a state of being resulting from cause and effect. And this can be changed through action within this lifetime. So this, these four noble truths provide the basic orientation and information needed to understand and experience on a personal level to gain an understanding of the Buddhist path. So the first noble truth describes dukkha, which is suffering or lack of satisfaction, and that dukkha is an innate characteristic of existence in the realm of samsara. Second, samudaya, origin or arising of this suffering, which comes together with craving, desire, or attachment. The third noble truth is known as nirodha, and that is cessation or ending of this dukkha or suffering, and this can be attained by the renouncement of letting go of this desire and attachment. The fourth noble truth is marga, meaning the path or the noble eightfold path, 
And this is the path leading to the renouncement of desires and attachments and ultimately the cessation of suffering. This is some of this classical Buddhist propaganda. There's only four things to know, okay? Listen, you have to know the first thing, the second thing, the third thing, and the fourth thing, and the fourth thing is an eight thing, okay? So, okay, now... It's still four things, but now there's this eight thing. Get it? So it's like, wait, wait a minute. I thought we were just doing four. Now we're doing eight. So this is where the Eightfold Path gets introduced. Well, part of the noble truth is all sects of Buddhism that I'm that I'm aware of, I, they still acknowledge it. How important it is depends on the different sect, and the the path working also depends on the sect. But it is like the pamphlet that gets you into the cult. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know? that's what I mean. It's <laughs> tricky. Again, with Avatar The Last Airbender, because this is just pretty much all Buddhism propaganda, now that I realize, when he, Aang goes to a temple ruin, Northern Air Temple, and finds a monk there, and the monk teaches him the, the Four Noble Truths to get him to, like, let go of worldly attachment so he can actually save the world. So, well, <laughs> that's awesome. I, I don't think it's fair to call Avatar, like, entirely Buddhist propaganda. Like, there's uh, a like lot, the air, though. Their air tribe was, was based off of Buddhists, but if you look at Uncle Iroh, he's, like, totally a Taoist. The, like, Aang's own journey is that of Siddhartha. He's a Buddha. I mean, he's a Dalai Lama, basically. We have to remember, the Hindus claimed the Buddha as their own, so everyone loves the Buddha. Like, yeah. everyone loves him. Yeah. Even atheists will uh, use Jesus as an example against Christians. He's a good idea. This brings us to the Eightfold Path. And we'll summarize them and then focus on the most interesting part for the sake of the show. So the steps of the Noble Eightfold Path are right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And moreover, there are three themes into which the path is divided, which would be good moral conduct, which is, includes understanding thought and speech, meditation and mental development that includes action, livelihood, and effort, and lastly, wisdom or insight, which contains mindfulness and concentration. We'll take a look at one of the principles that's contained in the right understanding. It's arguably the most important difference between the Buddhist teachings and the ones that came before it. In Buddhism, the doctrine of Anatman is that there is, in humans, no permanent underlying substance that can be called the soul. Instead, the individual is compounded of five factors that are constantly changing. The concept of Anatta, or Anatman, is a departure from the Hindu belief in the Atman, self. The absence of a self, or Anika, meaning the permanence of all being, and Dukkha, suffering, are the three characteristics of all existence, Tilakana. Recognition of these three doctrines, anatta, anika, and dukkha, constitutes right understanding, granted to you by the Department of State. This, in my opinion, is what makes Buddhism essentially antinomian, where it came about in a culture that believed in Atman. And its primary teaching after that was that there is no essential base self and that it is this misunderstanding which leads to so much suffering and attachment. Yeah, yeah this is like, a really hard thing to get over, right? As like a magician, to the point that uh, you are play. just a toy. Yeah, pretty much like in Toy Story. Like, what are you gonna do now when you get to that point of realization? It's kind of daunting. It's it's fucked up, and it's hard to get through. Like any sort of grip on what's after this. Like what the fuck? Like you're just reaching in the dark after that because you figured it out or something. You uh, are I don't not. Know. You are not a beautiful and unique snowflake. Like, the thing is, in concept, I really like Buddhism, and I like a lot of their practices. Like, it's great for a magician to know a little bit of Buddhism, but I feel like the alternative response as a magician is just to be ready for what comes next, to have an open mind, you and, know, to, yeah, to be if prepared. It looks like, if it looks like a dead end, it may not be. It may There may be a door hidden somewhere. Even modern-day Satanists are like, oh, we have to get to our true self or daemon and all. it's like buddha's like you don't got that that ain't real you don't exist motherfucker <laughs> no that I'm shit's real my true self. well once you understand your true self guess what it changes because you're alive you're trying to be the real buzz Lightyear, but it, it was never real but he's well, one of he... many buzz light years you know he's not really unique at all but he still is the savior in the end because he believes that he is or he believes in his own power when we address the topic of taoism uh i'm interested for that uh, because Taoism, I feel, is kind of like the natural response or, or like the natural counterpart to Buddhism, where in Taoism, 
it doesn't emphasize like attempting to find oneself or uh you know strength of who you are but Taoism essentially affirms that the practitioner is undoubtedly real and that they don't need to think about it because they would always be themselves that they they would always be expressing their Tao if they're not struggling. So the alternative is to accept suffering and just live. This kind of implies to me this whole I- idea of no self uh, implies mm-hmm. to me this idea that there's this base understanding that you know if you strip away our egotistical I am I and you are you. If you strip that away, we are all the same, and and it's the same if you look at nature. That you know, and a bird is just like another bird, just like another bird. There is this misconception of the idea of self that we use to separate ourselves uh, from everything else, and to remove that brings you to the emptiness state of nirvana. Yeah, like when they say the world is an illusion, it is because, I mean, there's really nothing separating you from me and me from you, right? <laughs> and if you're conscious, you're looking out of a pair of eyeballs. Any Anything that is alive and conscious and can see is looking out of a pair of eyeballs. So who's to say that the person inside your cranium looking out those pair of eyeballs is not the same entity that's inside my cranium looking out of my eye? Yeah, we give so much importance to all these different aspects of our lives, you know, whether it's material or or what you hold as being moral and right to you, uh, whatever your political alignment is. And we use this to like separate ourselves from each other. And basically this understanding is of no self removes all of that and says you're no different. So a little off the rails here, but at some point, trust me, I was joking with my bandmate the other day while we were having some drinks. Like, you know, if I was ever to actually start a cult, the step right before that leap of faith where you kind of have to do whatever I say, right? Because, like, that's that's what I'm doing if I did it, right? It'd be a lesson of this. Like, you don't need this. Like, all this shit don't matter. Like, like <laughs> you know, like, I think every religion or any philosophy, it should get to a point where you can realize something about the whole system that you're trying to get into is that it's not real is that like you know this isn't the end of it anyway like if you go through all these next hoops like you're still going to end up back at this lesson of like you got to kind of forget all this anyway except Um, in your cult nirvana is attained by licking your taint i don't know if anybody would go that high up the ladder oh look at the catholics actually taste mine but you know (laughs) the first rule of project mayhem is that you must trust tyler i know that you don't have a name in project mayhem And to be initiated in Project Mayhem, you must stand outside for three days without any reinforcement, shelter, or food. I'm pretty sure it's a it's a classic motif in the East where if you show up to a monastery, you have to like wait outside for three days to even be allowed in because they don't have anything for you. Whatever you came looking for is not there. No cult should like force you, you know, up to a certain point, like until you give them the the right to like, yeah, go ahead and force me now. Like after I chose to stand outside and maybe die at the front of your fucking door. Yeah. That's kind of like the unspoken gesture of you're free to go. You are willingly going to do this next shit. Like we're going to strip you and we're going to implant an idea or a belief in you. And you're going to just do what we say from here on out. That's what you want. Welcome in. Like a, <laughs> you know, like, like a fucking space monkey being ready to set into space for the greater good. All right. So I find it interesting that we've been comparing Buddhism to Fight Club this entire time. And I think the place that this comparison falls apart or where they become truly different is that they both teach non-attachment, uh, renunciation of worldly pleasures, you know, uh, except in Fight Club, they were extremely militaristic about this. And uh, in the end, they, they resorted to violence, which would kind of defeat their whole purpose, you know. Like, they're not going to change the world by blowing those buildings up. They're just going to make new ones. The Buddha was successful, at least somewhat, because he used his charisma and his wisdom to spread his message. He was, in a sense, both a wheel-turning monarch and the Buddha. I think where it is similar, though, is that in so much as the ending, spoiler, spoiler, the Buddha himself ends up caught almost in the machinations of his own organization that are going to continue beyond him and to propagate his message in his absence, like an intermingle it with the myths. 
Buddha didn't claim to be a god, but yet in the beginning of the story, you can't even find anything that doesn't say like, well, he was a he was a divine being in the in the heavens before he came down. And there's all this myth surrounding the Buddha. And this this myth making apparatus is part of his monastery. And in some regard, it's a good criticism in that the myths about the Buddha interrupt you from actually attaining Buddhahood. It's a distraction in a sense. And it's this superfluousness that occurs whenever an antinomian path becomes an established religion. Like what first begins as a liberation from the establishment ends up becoming the imprisoning establishment itself. His name was Robert Paulson. You know, like it ends up taking on its own egregore. So I think that's where it's similar. Yeah, you totally hit the nail on the head there, man. The Buddha taught consistently, growing his following into a well-articulated machine of liberation, hope, and spreading the Bodhidharma, the retaining of his teachings. Somebody years ago told me that there are instances of uh, Buddhist religious violence where, where they, like, you know, attempt to forcefully give them a little bit of the old convert. I pulled up an article just now, like, just like any other religion, and you were talking about how once a religion becomes established, they fall into the same trappings as any other. Buddhist extremism meet the violent followers of a religion widely known for its pacifism. Anti-Muslim monk Warathru, War, yeah, that's his name, Warathru, addresses a pro-military rally attended by thousands of nationalist demonstrators in Yangon. So in places where cultural change may be occurring or, or where, where there, there's new cultural influence, violence, like any other religion, still occurs. There have been instances of organized Buddhist religious violence, but of course, like, this is less well known than the Christian instances of it. And of course, because of Buddhism's reputation for peace, the first results that you'll get on the front page are Buddhists are not supposed to be violent. No real Christian man would suck a <laughs> dick. Is that like, thou shalt not kill? Unless it's for Jesus. It's murder, Katrina. Murder. You can kill. Now I'm never bored when I'm killing for the Lord. Yeah, you can kill all day long. It's murdering you can't do. This is a good thing to bring up because it establishes that Buddhism outgrew the Buddha and it created these motifs that we now associate with Buddhism. That being one. Another being vegetarianism. In fact, Within Buddhist followers, there was a cult that disagreed with the Buddha that they should be allowed to even eat meat at all, like people in general. Like that's all too much of an indulgence for them, right? Right. And the Buddha obviously didn't practice vegetarianism because his death is related to the eating of meat. So sometime around the year 483 BC, Buddha began to feel his attachment to the world weakening and allowed himself to partake of a meal of dried boar's flesh served to him by Kunda the smith, which gave him a terminal case of dysentery. According to legend, Buddha bade his party of monks to bury their meals while giving full funerary rites, which suggests that the Buddha knew the pork was tainted before he ate it. Not wanting to offend Kunda and see him shamed for serving the bacon that killed the Buddha, he offered his thanks as only two meals had ever blessed him exceptionally. The one that was given by Sunjata, which allowed him the strength to reach enlightenment, and this one given to him by Kunda, which led him to the final gates of Nirvana. So beautiful. I hate this story. <laughs> I don't know. I just think it's ironic in a beautiful way. Dude, okay, no. He's like, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to accept this meal because it is. it would offend him if I don't accept this meal. It's like, well, what do you think is going to be more offensive? Being like, I'm sorry, I, I'm quite good right now on the food. Or shitting yourself to death after eating the food. What do you think is going to make him feel worse? I personally think yeah. the guy would feel worse knowing that he's the one who made the Buddha shit himself to death. Yeah, but I think Buddha was trying to protect him from the other monks turning on this guy. I get like, it. It <laughs> might have been an accident. I mean, you don't know, but monks shouldn't be cooking meat. Let's just put it that way. Too long, didn't read. God committed suicide. Kunda was a smith, though. This was like some dried pork skin somewhere that Kunda was probably nomming on while he's hammering out weapons or whatever. Sounds like some Minecraft shit. He's like, oh, the Buddha's here. Let me get the rancid bacon. <laughs> Keeps it in his back pocket covered in his ass sweat. <laughs> I just straight up really don't like this story. I'm sorry. Yeah, I tried. No, I, I tried to like you know i tried to hear it out and i tried to hear out the underlying message in this story still don't like it <laughs> well hecka that's just a sign of your unenlightened and foolish nature you rotten 
cunt. All right. <laughs> well, I'll eat rotten cunt and shit myself to death then, I guess. You wouldn't want to offend you, dingus. Well, actually, that's somewhere in the Eightfold <laughs> Path where you have to trust Tyler. It's in there somewhere. Like, if you don't, then that's poor understanding. I'm very self-conscious <laughs> about my rotten cunt. I would appreciate it. Well, I wouldn't want to offend you. Can you smell the fish? I could smell the provolone. Uh, oh. Well, uh, all compounded things decay. Work out your own salvation with diligence. Those were the dying words of the Buddha. And with that, if you'd like to hear us talk about the sorcery in Buddhism, the bone spirits, state <laughs> oracles, and what a furba is, please visit www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit, where for just five bucks, you can get access to our whole library of extended shows and access to our discord server where you can ask us questions and talk to us about all the stuff we talk about on the show without being villainized for having the same interest that we do thank you everybody eat eat carrots. Carrots. shoot lasers eat boar meat and shoot diarrhea <laughs>